It was getting dark, and the hanging party lights illuminated the porch of the main house as the councillor trainees finished up their dinner. Paul stood up and banged on the table for attention. Okay, people, he said. Today was fun and games, right? I like to start slow, ease you into it. The response was a chorus of groans and weary muttering. If today was only starting slow, they didn't want to know about getting up to speed. So far as they were all concerned, they had signed on for a summer camp counselor training course, not survival lessons. Paul acted as if he were training a mercenary unit. Well, tomorrow we get serious, said Paul, to their complete disbelief. If anybody wants a last night on the town, now's your chance. Me, me, said Ted, raising his hand like a small boy begging to be called on in class. Paul smiled. Ginny started gathering up the dishes. Okay, who else? Paul said magnanimously. We want to go in as few cars as possible. Half a dozen hands shot up. Oh, and by the way, said Paul. Our two wanderers have volunteered to stay behind and watch the camp. He glanced pointedly at Jeff and Sandra. Haven't they? he said, a slight edge to his voice. Jeff and Sandra exchanged glances, sighed, and quietly lowered their hands. Right, Mr. Holt, Jeff said. Sure, said Sandra with resignation. Terry put her arm around Sandra, commiserating with her. I think I'll stay too, she said. Muffin might show up. The little dog was still missing, and Terry was trying hard not to show how worried she was about her pet. Scott overheard her and immediately changed his mind about going into town. I think I'll hang around too, he said with exaggerated nonchalance. He threw in a yawn for good measure. I'm pretty wiped out. Vicky sidled up to Mark. You staying? She said. Yeah, said Mark with a self-conscious shrug. Nothing spoils a party faster than a drunk in a wheelchair. That's crap, said Vicky, angry at his putting himself down like that. She hesitated, knowing he was sensitive and proud. Look, she said, not wanting to sound as if she was feeling sorry for him, because what she was really starting to feel was something entirely different. We can go together if you like. Mark gave her a tight smile. Appreciate it, he said. But I'm in training. It was his stock line, his excuse for everything, for denying himself the slightest pleasure. Vicky gave him a steady look. Then I'm staying too, she said softly. Mark shrugged awkwardly. Suit yourself. Paul watched with mild amazement as most of his charges backed out of his offer of a last night on the town. This didn't seem like them at all. He'd never known kids to turn down a chance to party. Maybe he really had been pushing them too hard. He glanced at Ginny. How about it, second in command? He said. You going? You buying? said Ginny with a grin. Sure, Paul said. You're on, she said. After the tables were cleared away and the dishes were all done, Ted borrowed the keys to Jeff's pickup truck, swearing that he'd be careful and leave it parked in town or let someone else drive if he had too many drinks. Paul decided to throw caution to the winds and ride with Ginny in her VW bug. Miraculously, it started right up. Now I know how you can afford tuition to grad school, Paul joked as he got in beside Ginny. You always find some fool to fix your car and stake you to some beer. You got it, she said, shifting into first and chugging off after Ted in Jeff's big pickup. Behind them, the counselors drifted back into the house. Terry silently wandered off away from the others, disturbed about her missing dog.
It wasn't like Muffin to run away like this, though Muffin had never been out in the woods before, either. She had debated leaving Muffin at home, but finally she hadn't been able to bring herself to do it. Muffin was her friend, and it wouldn't be right to leave her alone all summer, feeling abandoned. She realized that the woods provided dozens upon dozens of new, fascinating sights and sounds and smells for a dog that had spent most of its life in the suburbs, and Terry guessed that Muffin was probably exploring. When Muffin became hungry, she'd come back. At least that was what Terry fervently hoped. She didn't think she'd ever be able to forgive herself if something happened to Muffin because of her selfishness of wanting to bring the little dog along. She walked down the path leading to the lake, calling out for Muffin as she went, hoping to hear a joyful barking in response. But there was no sign of Muffin. The sun had gone down, and it was dark now. Terry was starting to feel worried. The casino was a rectangular-shaped frame building located on the edge of town. Neon beer signs lit up all the windows and live music throbbed out into the night. The parking lot was full and the interior of the bar was crowded with locals from Crystal Lake and several of the surrounding villages. It was a friendly, redneck sort of joint, with most of the patrons dressed in jeans and buffalo plaid flannels, cowboy straws and baseball caps. The band was laying down some hot and heavy rock and roll. They just finished doing their version of Alice Cooper's Under My Wheels, and now they were into a country number as people got out on the dance floor to shake it loose. Ted watched the cute, young, dark-haired waitress, Maggie, thread her way through the dancing couples and between the tables, balancing a tray of drinks. The moment he came in, he spotted her, and one look at those dimples, that saucy expression, that trim waist and tight ass, and those mini-skirted legs that were shaped to sheer perfection and Ted knew he was lost beyond all hope of redemption. As she approached, Ted picked up two empty amber bottles of the dark boulder beer he had been drinking, an unbelievably fine brew shipped in from Colorado, and he brought them up to his eyes as if they were binoculars. Oh, look at this, he said, staring at Maggie through the bottoms of the bottles. He really couldn't see her very well through the thick amber glass. But if he'd been able to see her, he might not have had the courage to speak up at all. I think I'm in love, he said. Maggie came up to stand directly in front of him. She leaned on the bar between them and smiled, indicating the eight empty bottles in front of Ted. Are you sure you don't want me to clear these? She said, raising her eyebrows. No, said Ted with a grin. I'm collecting these. Have it your way, honey, Maggie said, grinning at him. I just don't want the bar to fall down on you. She was astonished at his capacity. She'd seen guys drink half as much and be drunk on their asses. But Ted was one of those rare people whose metabolisms were extremely efficient. Maggie was studying to be a pharmacist, and she knew that being able to handle a lot of booze was not so much a matter of machismo as it was a simple matter of biology. Some people's metabolisms were able to handle the traumatic influx of a lot of alcohol due to the efficiency of the enzymes in their livers, though this was not by any means a ticket to a life of hard and fast drinking. It simply meant that they could handle the abuse a little better than most people. Eventually, if the pattern of overindulgence was continued, it would be as toxic to them as to anybody else. She could tell that the beers were starting to get to Ted, 
but unlike a lot of people, he wasn't becoming obnoxious as he started to get drunk. Instead, he was merely loosening up a little, losing his natural shyness, and finding the courage to say things that most guys wouldn't have any trouble saying when they were sober. Working in a bar, she had heard just about every line in the book. But there was something about the adorably clumsy way that Ted was coming on to her that was really sweet and endearing. And he was cute, too. She'd much rather have a guy who had an easygoing personality and didn't take himself all that seriously than some macho bonehead who thought he was God's gift to women. She smiled and winked at Ted before she moved away to take care of some other customers. I think she likes you, Paul said, smiling and giving Ted a friendly nudge with his elbow. Ted grinned like a fat kid in an ice cream parlor as he watched Maggie walk away. I think so too, he said. Convinced that she was putting just a little bit extra into her naturally sexy walk just for his sake. She knew he was attracted to her and she was returning his signals in her own delightful way. He couldn't believe it. Things like this simply didn't happen to him. Was it possible she really liked him? Life was truly wonderful, thought Ted. Take all the fears and paranoias out of the world, and they don't mean a thing when two people start clicking with each other, taking the biggest chance of all. In the final analysis, love really was the biggest gamble, and the only one worth taking. He took a swig of beer, then suddenly got serious. You know, he said to Paul, thinking about what had happened earlier that day. This whole thing is ridiculous, really. Two of our kids get hauled in today because five years ago, a girl panics and falls out of a canoe. It's absurd. Ginny pursed her lips as she toyed with her beer bottle. But what if there is a Jason? She wondered aloud. Paul snorted. Oh, bullshit, Ginny. She ignored the remark. Ted's comment had given her the opportunity to voice some of the thoughts she'd been having ever since she had arrived at Crystal Lake. What if there is some kind of boy beast roaming around Camp Crystal Lake? She wondered out loud. Let's think beyond the legend. Try to put it in real terms. You know, what would he be? An out-of-control psychopath? A frightened retard? A child trapped in a man's body? She glanced at Paul, who was more familiar with the story than she was. He'd be grown by now, right? Paul nodded, an amused expression on his face. Right, he said, humoring her. And the only person that ever really knew him was his mother, Ginny said. She tried to imagine what it must have been like for a young Jason Voorhees, an outsider no matter where he went. Or what he did. He never had any friends. She was everything to him. Yeah, Paul said, wryly. A deranged killer. No, no, Ginny protested. You're missing my whole point. I doubt that Jason would have even known the meaning of death. Or at least until that horrible night. Her voice trailed off as she tried to reconstruct what must have happened on that fateful night at Camp Crystal Lake when Pamela Voorhees had gone on her maddened killing spree. He must have seen the whole thing happen, Ginny said, thinking out loud, trying to fit the elements of the legend in with the possible reality. He must have seen his mother killed just because she loved him she said, her eyes staring intently off into the distance. Wasn't that what her revenge was all about? She asked Paul. Her sense of loss? Her rage at what she thought happened? Her love for him? She glanced from Ted to Paul. They were watching her with interest, as if they were not certain if she was actually being serious or not. Bizarre, isn't it? Said Ginny. I mean... Just think about it. He has to be crying out for her return. Her resurrection. She turned to Paul. What do you think? 
Paul grinned and shook his head. I think you're drunk, he said. Ted laughed and picked up his beer bottle. He had to search a minute to find the full one in the midst of all the empties. I'll drink to that, he said. He waved at Maggie. Hit us again, sweetheart. Not me, said Jenny, knowing when she'd reached her limit. She glanced at Paul. I'm serious about this, Paul. She said, slightly annoyed at his dismissing her ideas that way. Jason is a legend, Jenny, Paul said, patiently. A legend. Terry stood looking out across the dark lake, savoring the silence of the moment. She had been walking around, calling Muffin without avail. She stood on the lake shore and sighed. Afraid to admit to herself the possibility that something might have happened to her little dog. It's all my fault, she thought. Muffin's never been out in the woods before. I should have brought a collar and a leash for her. Still, she had seemed so happy, running about like a puppy, enjoying the experience of a completely new environment. Just as she herself was enjoying the freedom of being away from her parents and her schoolmates, her hometown and everything she knew, meeting new people and having new experiences. You can't always be protected, she thought. Sometimes you just have to take a chance and open yourself up to new experiences. Sure, Opening yourself up to new things involved a certain degree of risk. But if you never took any risks, you never learned anything new. She found herself thinking about Scott. He was really good looking and he seemed like a nice guy. If only he didn't act like such a dork. What was it about guys, she wondered that they seemed to think a girl could only be interested in someone who was always smooth and cool, completely in control. Why did they always have to play these games, these silly bullshit games that always manifested themselves as aggressive behavior toward the girls they were attracted to? Why couldn't they simply kick back and chill out, be honest with their feelings, come right out and tell a girl they liked her and wanted to get to know her better? Was that really all that hard to do? Maybe part of it is our own fault, Terry thought. Maybe we put too much pressure on them. Christ, they get enough pressure from the other guys they hang out with. It's not as if they need any more pressure from the girls. She imagined what it must be like in a boy's locker room, the sort of conversations they must have. Some guy gets a date with a really foxy-looking girl, and immediately all his friends want to know how far he got with her. Hey, man, what's the score? Did you get laid? You get any pussy off her? What's she like? I hear she's real hot. Of course, there was a certain amount of pressure on the guy to not look like a complete wimp. He had to pretend that he had made out, so to speak. Even if all he wanted to do was go out to a movie with a girl and maybe a bite to eat afterward, perhaps just sit in the car and talk and get close to someone. Getting close to someone didn't really have anything to do with fucking. Terry had no doubts on that score. Fucking was really very easy. If you could do sit-ups or push-ups, you could fuck. It was a physical act and nothing more. Fucking didn't make you a man, and it sure as hell didn't make you a woman, no more than doing push-ups or sit-ups made you a man or a woman. There was nothing complicated about it at all, but the consequences of it were. There were some pretty serious implications involved in having sex, both emotional and physical. If you were smart, you could take some precautions to make sure you didn't get pregnant or contract some disease. 
But there was a lot more to it than that, something too many of her friends seemed to forget, or just not think about. For one thing, there was no such thing as safe sex, no matter what anybody said. Terry knew of several girls who had gotten pregnant after having been with guys who had used condoms. A condom could break or have a pinhole in it, or it could actually come off inside the girl. She'd heard stories of that happening. She had even heard of a case where a girl had gotten pregnant with an IUD. A diaphragm was no sure thing either, and birth control pills, while probably the safest way to go, could still have some hazardous side effects. However, beyond the mere physical consequences that went along with having sex, there were the emotional consequences too, which could be a lot more serious, even if they did not result in pregnancy. Making love with someone was about the most intimate thing that you could do, and if you weren't ready for it emotionally, it could really mess you up. After all, there was a big difference between making love and having sex. And if one person thought that he or she was making love, while the other person only thought that they were fucking, then somebody was being used. Terry was no prude. Far from it. She had gone all the way with guys before, but it had never really meant much. Oh, it had felt nice all right, but when it came right down to it, there had to be a lot more to it than that. And if there was one thing Terry had learned, it was that love and sex were completely different things. You could have love without sex, and it could still be special, but sex without love didn't mean very much at all. Terry was not inhibited about the way she looked. She was proud of herself. She had a naturally great body, and she took special care to keep it that way. With a figure like hers, she had learned early on that men would stare at her. It didn't really bother her. Sometimes, just to show them what it felt like, she would stare back, and every time it happened, they always looked away. What bothered Terry was people who made assumptions about her based on their own preconceptions about the way she looked. Scott didn't really do that, but in his own way, he was just as frustrating. She thought that perhaps a guy as handsome as Scott might understand about people making superficial comments based on the way that someone looked. But he seemed to have the same misconceptions as a lot of guys she'd known. He seemed to think that a simple, honest, direct approach would never work because someone who looked the way she did must have heard every line there was. So Scott seemed to think that the way to go about it was to tease her and play games with her, just to prove that he was not intimidated by her. She sighed. Some guys just never grew up. We are all so afraid of being rejected, Terry thought, that we can't even talk to one another anymore. She kicked off her shoes and felt the water with her toe. It was cold, but not too cold for swimming. She looked around. The others were all back up at the main house. It was dark, and she was all alone. The only illumination came from the spotlight mounted on the boathouse roof. It reflected in shimmering ripples off the dark water. Why not, she thought. She peeled off her sweatshirt and then took off her pants, putting them down by a rock close to the shore. Then she stripped off her panties and waded naked into the dark, cool lake. When she got up to her thighs, she took a deep breath and plunged in, experiencing the bracing shock of the cold water. After a moment, she was used to it 
and she started an easy Australian crawl stroke, cutting through the dark water and then ducking down beneath it, breaststroking underwater for a short distance and then bursting up for a deep breath of cool air. It felt great to skinny dip alone at night, but after a while she started to feel cold and swam toward shore. She came out feeling refreshed and invigorated, although the wind had picked up slightly and she hugged herself against the chill. And then she noticed that her clothes were gone. For a moment she stood still, uncertain if she was looking in the right place or not. And then she heard a chuckle and spun around to see Scott coming out from behind the boathouse, carrying her clothes in his arms. Looking for something? he said, grinning and eyeing her appreciatively. She covered herself with her arms and looked at him with exasperation. Come and get him, he said, backing away toward the woods as she approached, tossing her one piece of clothing at a time, starting with her sneakers, first one, then the other, followed by her panties and her sweatpants. She followed him, hopping on one foot to put her sneakers on, then slipping on her panties and her sweatpants. She cursed him under her breath as he kept laughing and dancing away from her reach, not at all amused by this childish display. If I get my hands on you... Scott laughed and dangled the shirt just beyond her reach, jerking it away each time she tried to get it from him. Scott, it's no longer funny, she said. He backed away from her, taunting her and waving her shirt as if he were a bullfighter. But then his laughter was cut short abruptly as his feet were snapped out from under him and he was yanked upside down into the air. Ah, he shouted, help. He had stepped into a snare, and now he hung twisting from the spring pole by his heels, completely helpless. God damn that, Paul, Scott swore furiously. Him and his wilderness bullshit. Terry slipped on her shirt and glanced at him anxiously, momentarily forgetting her anger at him. What can I do? she said. Get me down, that's what, said Scott. Terry moved under him and tried to support his weight so that she could loosen the loop around his ankles, but it was useless. He was too heavy for her, especially hanging upside down the way he was. Dead weight. I'll have to get a knife, she said, and cut the rope. Hurry, Scott pleaded with her, no longer feeling so cocky. Okay? She stepped back, looking at him thoughtfully, and walked around him in a slow circle, smiling at his predicament. It served him right. I ought to let you hang, you pervert, she said, deciding to rub it in a little. Come on, Terry, he pleaded. Give me a break. You gonna cut the crap? Sure, anything. I promise. She gave him a long look, watched him squirm. Okay, she said at last. And then she added with a grin. Don't go anywhere. Scott grimaced wryly. Very funny. She grinned at him, enjoying how the tables had been turned, then trotted off back up to the path leading to the cabins. Allowing him to squirm a bit was one thing, but leaving him hanging for very long would not be safe. The blood would all rush to his head. She ran up the steps to her cabin and opened the door. She hurried over to the closet and pulled down her backpack. She knew she had a Swiss army knife in there somewhere and started rummaging for it. Meanwhile, the time seemed to pass with excruciating slowness for Scott. He was beginning to feel a little dizzy. Where the hell was she? She would come back, wouldn't she? Surely she wouldn't just leave him here like this, would she?
The wind picked up a little, and he began to turn gently in the breeze. Suddenly, he felt someone grab him by the hair and give a sharp, painful yank. Before he could even cry out, the blade of a machete flashed before him, and he felt white heat lance across his throat. Blood spurted from his severed jugular, running down his neck to his chin, trickling across his face into his eyes as he swung gently in the breeze. He tried to scream, but his trachea and larynx had been cut clean through. His voice box had been severed, and he couldn't make a sound. Terry came running down the path, coming from her cabin, carrying the Swiss army knife in her right hand. She stopped about a foot away from where he hung, turned away from her. Scott, she said firmly, putting her hands on her hips. I'm going to cut you down, but if you ever do anything like that again, I'm going to kill you. There was no response. Scott, she said uncertainly, wondering if he had fainted. She reached out and turned him around, then recoiled, staggering back away from him and screaming as she saw the gaping, grisly wound upon his throat, the vivid streaks of blood running down his face into his hair and dripping to the ground. Terry kept screaming uncontrollably. She backed away in horror, and then she turned around. A blade flashed in the moonlight and cut off her screams. <laughs>